Next up, I hope you guys are very excited. We have Nagio's official Australian English interpreter right here. The original Thunder from Down Under. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Troy Lee. Thank you, Paul. Well, welcome everyone, and thanks for coming to my talk about VMware virtualization um, using VMA and the plugin Box 293 Check VMware. Before I begin, just a quick overview of myself. I have started back in the DOS and Windows 3.1 days and have done many support roles over the years, looking after desktops to enterprise infrastructure. And I've taken all of that experience together and decided to become a bit of a Nagios developer. I first started using Nagios, it was Nagios XI in 2009, and I really like XI because it's a virtual appliance. It takes all the Linux stuff that I don't know and puts it in a virtual machine, I download it, I turn it on, and I have a fully functional monitoring product. It's kind of funny though because this year I've made the switch to Linux as my own desktop operating system using Mint Linux. So it's, uh, I like it. Now, why should you listen to me? And why is this of any use to you? Rather than let me tell you, why don't I let others tell you? These are people who have emailed me uh, requests for the plugin or stuff that's posted in the forums. Just to give you a, a feeling that this isn't just some little bit of code I've worked on and I think you should give it a go. It's something that's quite useful and you will find use yourself. So why did I create the plugin? Well, to start off with, I tried the other plugins out there and I wasn't happy. Either they were too confusing, there was no manual. Um, when you scaled up the solution, it just crippled your Nagios host. And it didn't have some of the options I wanted. I also like to do auditing. So things like MTU sizes, version settings. If I can check that and know that it's always right, then that's just one more bonus for me. So what is VMA? VMA is called the VMware vSphere Management Assistance. It's a virtual appliance. It was released by VMware when they released ESXi. Because when they released ESXi, it was a much more hardened version of ESX, their hypervisor, so they needed a way of allowing admins to manage and use their ESXi hosts. Now it's just a SUSE VM, you can see here, but the key thing here is that it has the Perl SDK installed on it. There's nothing else you need to do. I can just use this, put my plugin on it, and it works, which means all my development is always done on one of these boxes, which means that I know it's going to work on your box, your VMA appliance, when you use it. So why use it? It's basically, the key thing here is to offload that VMware SDK from your Nagios host. It's very resource intensive. It's CPU and memory hungry. And when you do your initial tests, like you might monitor two hosts and everything seems peachy, but then you go, right, let's do all 50. And then that's when suddenly something goes wrong and everything just grinds to a halt and nothing's being monitored. Also, you can deploy it in minutes. You just download this VMA host from the VMware website, deploy it into your infrastructure, turn it on, and it's as simple as that. So how does Nagios use VMA? It's very simple. The Nagios host itself does a check by SSH check to the VMA appliance. The VMA appliance will talk to the vCenter server or the SXI hosts issue the request it wants, gets the data, and sends that back. So I'm not using check and RPE or anything like that. There's no agents to install. The most important thing is just having that SSH session working, and that will allow for a passwordless connection from your Nagios host to the VMA appliance, and means you don't have to expose passwords in your configurations. Will it work with vCenter or ESX or ESXi? It works with all of them. It's not, vCenter is not required to use the plugin. However, there's certain checks that are only available via vCenter, like cluster checks and those sorts of things. The, the great thing of checking your host through vCenter is you only need one set of credentials to connect to the vCenter instance, 
and then it issue it works with all the hosts and guests in the uh, vCenter instance to do all the work for you. And is it secure or is it safe? So with the vCenter appliance, with the, when you connect to a vCenter server, you only need read-only credentials. The, you create an account, whether it's in your AD or on a local on the vCenter host itself, and you set up permissions in the vCenter tree so that you only require the read-only role. The user account that you have created is added to the VMA appliance to what they call the credential repository in the VMA appliance. And it's, uh, that, that is how the VMA appliance knows what user account and password to talk to when it talks to that vCenter server or that ESXi host. With ESXi direct with that vCenter, I haven't done any testing yet with read-only accounts, but it should be able to be set up with my own development and testing so far, it's just been done with the root account. But in the future, I'll add that to the manual on how you can add read-only access directly on ESXi host. The point of the credential repository on the VMA appliance is that you only have to manage the password once. The password is stored in the credential repository, and when you issue the check by SSH, to the VMA appliance. The VMA appliance runs the Box 293 Check VMware plugin. It knows what host it's going to talk to, whether it's vCenter, and it looks in the credential repository and goes, ah, I've got credentials for that host, and then uses them and talks. So if you update your password, you update it once in the credential repository, and that's all you have to do. So you don't need any passwords in your Nagios configurations. So how do I get it up and running? I'm not going to run through that here because it's very simple and it's in the manual. And when I say it's in the manual, it has step-by-step -step instructions. Put it here, run this command, run this command, do this on Inagios host, set up your SSH connection, test it, does it work? Okay, now proceed to the next step and so forth. And that's one of my other goals of the plugin was to have a manual that was easy to understand and it make it easy for you guys to implement. So, I like to have these little quick breaks because it stops me just rambling on. So, it's, that's all it is. So, what can it monitor? Lots. There's a lot of stuff it can monitor and if you find there's something it doesn't do that you want, let me know. We can work together, we'll add it in there, we'll make it happen. Um, as a, what we're going to go through is all the different checks, what they can do. I might not sit on one for very long, I might just fly past it, but you'll get an example command and output so you can see what's going to happen. Before I do that, there are some common options I've also added to the plugin, and one of them is thresholds. Now, we all have thresholds, but in particular, I wanted to be able to specify the warning and criticals and you don't have to have a warning to have a critical and so forth. You can have some of the checks, such as this one here, disk rate and disk latency. They are two different things that you're checking against, so you want two different thresholds to, to alert against, whether it's warning or critical. So you can combine those together with a comma to have the different um, thresholds provided with the plugin. And you'll see examples of this as we go along. The other common option is the reporting units. And this was something where I got sick of plugins outputting something in a value that I didn't care about. It might be 10,000 megahertz is in use. That's great, but I want it in gigahertz. So you get to specify, if you want, what the actual reporting unit you want it to be. You can, it has a default value, so it'll just, I, I have defined my own default values that the scripts use. If you want to override that, you can. And once again, you can have multiple reporting units for different types of units that are being used, like data store rate and latency. Probably the last one is concurrent checks. And this is a, a little option I added to the plugin, which makes the plugin only run so many times in the VMA appliance. This prevents an ac accidental overrun condition like a chain reaction of events where 
something's timing out or it's taking longer to run the check, so it goes into a unknown state, so the Nargis reschedules a check sooner, and then suddenly you're issuing more and more checks and the device is just falling apart. So this stops that from happening. When it runs, it checks how many are running, and then it quits before it starts running all the important, all the important checks first. If you find that you need to increase this, you've got the option there to do it. Just make sure you size the VMA appliance that suits your environment. So read the manual. There's a lot of options available, and they're all covered in detail in the manual. So let's look at the checks we'll go through, just to break it up a bit. OK, so for our vCenter oriented checks and cluster checks, starting off with we have a, a cluster CPU usage. Uh, here we have the actual, I might come over this side so I'm not in the way. But we have basically, you have to have the cluster name. You can have the optional arguments here for CPU speed, your warning and critical values. But here's the command. It's the plugin, the check the cluster CPU usage, the actual vCenter server we're talking to, and the name of the cluster. And that's the output here. And you've got, it's got performance data here. Um, well, some of the plugins I'm going to bring, some of the checks I'm going to bring up big on the screen so we can get a better look at what's actually being reported. And this one will be one of them, the cluster DRS status. So if you've got a distributed resource, schedule a cluster set up. Well, to start off with, you might want to actually check that DRS is turned on on that cluster. An admin might have gone and turned it off. So it's going to look for that. In this case, here's the check. It's checking the DRS status, it's actually checking that the automation level is set to manual, and it's checking if the DPMS level is set to on. In this case, it's critical. Why is it critical? Well, the automation level is fully automated, but should be manual. Migration threshold one, DPM is off, but should be on. So there are two different things causing it to go critical, but I'm telling you what they are, so you don't have to go and look to find out what's critical, but what exactly is critical in the check. EVC status, this is just if you want to make sure that the cluster is running at a certain EVC mode for the enhanced virtualization. Cluster high availability status, this is once again similar to the DRS. It has the, the different modes, the different things you can check, and this one you can see it's okay, and it's just reporting the okay, and it's just telling you what everything is set at. Admission control is disabled, these are just all the options, and they just display. It's a good little, this gets back to my auditing sometimes, to see that the way you set it up is remaining the way it's set up. Cluster memory usage. This one gathers all the, all the hosts that are in the cluster, calculates how much memory is being used. If it's, uh, if it's a HA cluster, then it, the high availability sets aside a certain amount of resources for that HA, so you actually have an effective amount, a total amount, and what the free amount is. You know, you, the total amount here is 12, whoops, 12 gig, um, but uh, I have an effective amount of four, four and a half gig. So it's just a, all of this is in performance metrics as well. So you can see when you add an extra host to the cluster, you will see a big jump in resources now available. Or you might put three hosts in maintenance mode. Well, the effective available at that point will drop because the amount that it can actually use as changes versus against three hosts just sitting in the cluster running, doing nothing. Cluster resource info, this is a bit of a combination of CPU and memory usage, and it always returns an okay state. So this is more information gathering to gather performance data, to look at stuff over time. How much, you know, you might look at the 9 a.m. login peak and the 5 p.m. log off peak, and you'll see the CPU re usage rise or the, the usage drop and the memory rise and the memory drop, those sorts of things. This one is one of those ones that outputs a hell of a lot of data. <laughs> There's a, one of the things I've done in the plugin is to give you a lot of performance data where I think is necessary. We might. Sometimes there might be more than is required, I'm not sure. 
If I'm not sure, I put it in there because someone will just come and ask me later. Cluster swap file status. This is one of those ones, if you don't know what this means, then it doesn't affect you. But if you have um, the, if a memory, a guest memory or a host runs out of memory, it needs to start swapping out to disk. Well, this is whether the, the policy is set to be store in the VM directory or to store on the local host. And you can change these options. Cluster vMotion info. This is a really good one to see. Because the vMotion info, this is just a counter that every time a vMotion happens, it just increments by one. So if there's something happening in your environment every, when backups happen at night, and it causes a bunch of vMotions, you're not at work to observe this. So this is a way of seeing, well, at 10 p.m. every night, there's 20 vMotions that happen. And it just, every night it goes up. So it's a way of identifying trends in your environment. Is your vCenter server licensed? I don't know. This is a way to find out. You can hide the key if you don't want it. In this case, I've hidden the key. I'm standing in the way of that option. But on the end there, you can see I've got the hide key option. So the result that comes back is just the version. And it says it's OK, it's licensed. This is the name and the version. This is a bit more of an auditing thing I like. I just want to find out. What version is it? So without having to log into the product, I can go to my single pane of glass, being Nagios, and find out that information. Right, guests. So these are the VMs. I like to call them guests because it's more than a virtual machine, and it's what VMware called it, and I decided to stick with it. These are going to get quite detailed at time. Guest CPU info. This is one where you can look at reservations and limits and alert if there are reservations set or alert if there's limits set or if there is not set. Um, how many cores? Now, this is an info. So this is more about not what's used, but more what it has. How many CPUs does it have? How many cores? What does it add up to in actual megahertz? How many sockets? Because you might have one socket, but to cores per socket, those sorts of things. But you might want to make sure that limits haven't been set. Or you might want to make sure that limits have been set. So the options are there. And this one brings up, in this case, I had four cores in total. There were two sockets, two cores per socket. How much total megahertz? There's no reservation happening, there's no limit, the, well the limit is the size of, I can't remember to be honest, but there it is. Guest CPU usage, now this is more about what's happening on the guests, and this will tell you the actual, um, the CPU speed and the, and the ready time you can alert on these variables. So you can, for instance, if there's so much CPU being used, you can alert on that, and whether it's uh, free or if it's used. Some people like to report on how much is free. Some people like to report on how much is used. Options are there. And ready time. And the ready time, if I'm correct, the alerting only happens on the total value, but all of the information about each core is reported there. The same with the CPU usage. So you can see if one particular core is being hit, then you can actually uh, detect that perhaps there's a, a software package that's not multi-threaded running in that VM that isn't making full use of all of those cores. Guest disk performance. You see I'm having to squeeze down the size of the font just to put in the amount of information I'm outputting. With this one, disk performance can be your disk rate, so your read and writes in kilobits, the number of reads and writes, and also the latency. And you can report, you, once again, you can change the reporting units and you can alert on the different thresholds. And lots of information. Great for graphs, great for looking at what's happening over time. Guest disk usage, it gets into overall usage. If it's a virtual disk, what the virtual disk usage is, if it's got thin or thick provisioning, uh, the, the snapshots that could be in place and how much disk space that they're using, 
Um, and there's a total sum and all that, and you can alert on how much space is being used. Here's an example, this one here, where we have a suspend file. So this one's actually suspended when I take, when I was doing this check. It's also got a snapshots in place that's taking up space. It's also thin provisioned at 80 gigs, but it's only using 27 gigs. A lot of useful information here. Guest memory info, it's very similar to the CPU info check. Um, you can once again check on limits and reservations. And with memory, these are some very important things that you do or do not want to happen. This is another example of where I've got a critical, and I'm telling you, the critical for the reservation is not equal to 1,024, but there's also a warning happening for my limit is not equal to 3,096. So critical is the higher of the two, so the overall state of the check is critical, but there's also other things going on that you need to know, so they're also highlighted so you know exactly what they are. Guess memory usage, like CPU usage, once again. This one, it has some overall usage of how much, um, it's got ballooning as well, that's what I wanted to highlight. So you can find out if the VM's ballooning and you wanna act on that because it's gonna slow down the performance of the VM. Guess NIC usage, this is one I found that was missing in a lot of the plugins, so what's going on? how much in and out is happening, and the actual packets that are received and transmitted. Snapshots. This is one of the very few checks that will go and gather all of the items in the cluster. So it'll find all the guests if they're in a cluster, or they could, you could target a data center, or you could target a host, or you could target just one guest. And it will tell you, in this case, that we're looking at the data center box 293. Our warning is five days old and our critical is 15. And we have some machines that are more than 15 days old with snapshots and some that are more than five days old with snapshots. But you can just target a single uh, VM if you wanted to or the whole data center. Probably the only thing I didn't mention was with the way the, the Perl module works that the plugin uses, it, there's a lot of information that is gathered when it pulls an object from the vCenter or ESXi, and that information consumes memory on the VMA appliance or the SDK. So a lot of the other plugins will get all the objects and then do a match on the one it's looking for. Mine finds the object that I want and only gets that information, so it makes the performance much less on the VMA appliance, makes it faster, the data that's transferred, less load on the vCenter or ESX host it's pulling it from. It's a bit of tidbit of information. Guest status, this is a new one I added recently. <coughs> Excuse me. That talks about, it checks the uptime state, the power state of the VM, the version of the tools, if it needs consolidation, it will give you alerts if you need. I'll just have a quick drink. A lot of these checks now with host are pretty much all the same as the guests with memory and CPU and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not really going to sit on them very quick, very long. I'll just fly through them. But data store performance is an interesting one where I can look at the uh, actual, the read and the write rates, and what I'm actually doing here at the same time is calculating the read percentage in relation to the overall read and write total, and the write percentage in relation to the overall read and write total. And that can be helpful for when you're looking at white papers about SQL servers that might need 60, 40 read write ratio. So what is the ratio? There it is. Now these. These numbers, these percentage numbers, aren't actually being put into the performance data string because that would just waste space in the actual um, RRD files where, this, where it's stored when the graphing tool that you use can quite easily calculate that value based off the read and the write 
and do a simple percentage thing. And here's an example of these are all reads and these are writes. So we've got read and write rate for the perform data store performance, the number of reads, the number of writes, the latency for the read and the writes. And you can just pick up patterns. Obviously, something was happening here. What it was, I don't know, but if I wanted to find out, I've got somewhere to start looking. Data store usage, how much is it using? Pretty straightforward stuff. Host CPU info. This is more about what's in the host. More of an auditing check. You know, or not auditing, but information gathering. And you can see I've got a really advanced AMD A10 APU running this. Host CPU usage, straightforward stuff. Host license status, this was like before with the vCenter. Um, and in this example, I haven't chosen to hit hide the key so it's displayed there at the bottom. When you use a read-only account, the middle three sections of the license key are automatically grayed out. You only see the start and end numbers, and that's just how the VMware SDK works. Host memory usage, pretty straightforward stuff. Host OS, name and version, once again, if you you could create a service group of all your hosts that have this check, and then you could, at a single glance, look at what version they're all at. I love this sort of stuff. Host PNIC status. PNIC being a physical NIC. Now you can, by default, this check will gather all the NICs on the host and give you the status of those NICs, whether it's the checks of speed, the duplex of state, Really, it only, in this case, will trigger on the state. If it's disconnected, it will trigger an alarm. In this case here, I have three total, but only one of them's connected, and two of them are disconnected. And then it goes into the details about each one and tells me which one is actually disconnected and so forth, and also tells me the speed and the duplex. You can use the name argument to specify a single host or a combination of NICs, like VMNIC0, VMNIC1, and so forth. Host PNIC usage, this is a great one for, uh, once again, getting the data, that what's happening on the physical NICs, but you might have teams of NICs, you might have two NICs for the management network, you might have two NICs for the guest VMs in a team, and another two NICs for iSCSI, so you can, gather the performance statistics on each one of those, and that's, once again, using the name argument. You can use, like, VMNIC0, comma, VMNIC1, and you'll only get the information on those NICs. And you can trigger alerts. It gathers information on the rate and how many packets actually happen, and on SXI and later, packet errors, which is a great one for finding faulty cabling or NICs or I thought it was useful, so I decided to add it in. And we have, oh, it's all right, example graphs. Here we go, so it's the same as again, I've got my read and my write rate, I've got my packets, read and write, and my packet errors, and nothing's going wrong with my NICs. Host status, this will check Configuration status at the moment, I'm going to work on in the future adding hardware status. But things like text support or you know, um, SSH is enabled or console access is enabled. By default, that actually triggers little yellow exclamation marks in vCenter. So you can actually exclude those issues. If they're things that you want turned on and they're normal for you, then there's an exclude issue flag and you can actually prevent those from causing an alert. So it just makes things easier. Host storage adapter info. Um, this is, you know, your, your, this could be a physical SAS card that has all your physical disk connected to it. It could be an iSCSI adapter that's connecting to NICs and so forth. So you can get information about what it is, and the other check you can get is performance about that storage adapter. So you might want to see, it's just like the NICs before with the read and the writes. And in this case here, 
I've got my read rate and my write rate for this storage adapter, my number of reads and my number of writes, and my latency reads and writes. And you can see this jump here again. I had that jump before on my data store, I think, if I'm right, or I can't remember which one. But you can see there's a pattern forming there in the data that I was, I'm looking at. So I'm starting to put together pieces of information to find out what this is actually doing. Something's happening and now I've got two areas where I'm getting information so I can start to join dots together. And this is what I like most about monitoring is the statistical data that you can go back and look at your baseline trends over time so when something does go wrong, you've got something to go back and look at. Host switch status. When I was talking before about uh, um, iSCSI NICs, you want to make sure that the MTU size is correct. So with this, you can actually check that the MTU size on the switch is correct. You know, you need it to be 9,000 when you're dealing with 10 gig Ethernet um, iSCSI SANs and those sorts of things. So, and it also checks the NICs that are inside the switch as well. Um, oh, that's a, this in particular was reporting that the MTU is 1,500, that should be 9,000, and it's, that's why it's gone the critical status. So once again, it's just an example of how you can define different options to be critical and warning. <coughs> Host VNIC status, other management um, interfaces like your, um, they can be a kernel, it can be a, is a, an iSCSI interface that you've defined. Um, it could be an NFS mount interface. There's a couple of different interfaces. So you can check that they're correct. Um, you can check if the MTU is right. A couple of things like that. Just more interesting stuff. Right. I think I've covered everything, but there's just one more thing. And I have introducing a wizard for Nagios XI. So coming soon, I'm going to have a configuration wizard that will talk to your infrastructure, present all the options that we just talked about, let you click lots of boxes, tick buttons. Here are some examples. In this case, I'm pulling down guests. I've, I have actually, this works in com Bind, can combine with a component I've created that I define my VMA host and my vCenter servers for these larger deployments. So when you run the wizard, you can select these different hosts and then you can get the, all the guests. You can tick the buttons or you can select them all. If it finds the guests in ESX, uh, in, sorry, if it finds the guests in XI, it actually will show you and pre-select them in the list. But for ones that you haven't, you have to give them a name and address because they all need host objects. Then when you get in, those objects that we're going to create, we can set intervals for the check intervals for the host objects themselves, the ping checks that are created, the guest checks themselves. So at the top here, this is guests, CPU, disk, memory, NIC, snapshot. So they're broken up into groups. So in this case here, we're looking at disks on this one here. So for each guest that I have, I want to check this one is the disk performance. So uh, you know, what, uh, of that guest, what's the disk performance? And do I want some read and write, uh, my warning for read latency and write latency for write? Um, there's all, the whole point of this is you, there's, there's, it's all automated for you. You can just click through it. And there's some really cool things I've added here. Well, I think it's cool is you can define here, say, the check interval, the retry interval, the number of tries, the warning and the critical, tick all these boxes, set all these values and everything, then select one, that one there and click propagate and all the other ones will then have these values. So you don't have to spend hours clicking and typing and clicking and typing and hoping it's all correct. There's also a randomized check interval that will go through this check interval for each one and put a different number there between a four and an eight, or whatever numbers you want to put, just so you can spread your load out even more. <sighs> Quick break. <laughs> I wish I had muscles like that. So the conclusion, it's a plugin. 
Panagios. It's easy to implement. I hope it's feature rich. There's a wizard coming soon. It's well documented. And if it's not, tell me and I'll change the document. And the doctor's orders are to implement as soon as possible. On that note, are there any questions? We have a wonderful man, Paul, over here. He has a microphone that he loves to shove in your face. Most definitely. Oh, we've got one down here. Are all of the graphs that you showed uh, automatically integrated with the check, or is that something you have to go through and manually set up? They, they, they all always output performance data. Is that the question? Yeah. Some don't have any performance data at all, if I don't deem it necessary, like version of the operating system and things like that. With the way that you have the wizard set up, uh, you, you did show part of it uh, where you set up the, the mins, maxes, uh, times for check inter intervals and everything else. Uh, is there also a way to select the host groups and the, and the contacts in, that would be applied to those particular hosts? On the next step of the wizard, yep. the normal host groups mm -hmm. and all those and selections are available. And they and will apply to all the services and host objects that are created because of the wizard. Now, because you were showing there that it's a specific IP uh, that it's going to run down, I guess, from the cluster and all the hosts associated with, with that, yep. uh, is there any other way to do it where you're giving it a, a, a range, like say one octet uh, within uh, like a specific uh, subnet that you can, that you can hit, hit everything on there? In, in, As opposed to one one cluster, um, with multiple clusters, and you know, so you're just hitting one octet on that subnet just to basically. I'll have to talk to that one offline about that. Oh, fair enough. It's, I basically what I've done is I've set up a, a component that we define all these settings in, so that when you run the wizard, it goes and queries the vCenter server and pulls all that information back and then pre-populates all that information in. So I might have to talk to you offline and make it so we can get a clearer understanding on that one. Yeah, that's good enough, thank you. Anyone else? Don't be shy now. Um, the uh, VMA, that was uh, SCUSE, right? Or yes. The appliance? Um, would it be terribly difficult to port that to a different distro if I felt so inclined? One of the things I really strive for was to develop something that did not require a lot of prerequisites and fiddling around installing other stuff. So when I develop the plugin and I code directly on the VMA appliance, I know that it works. And when I give it to, when someone else downloads it and they follow my instructions, I know it works. I won't provide support for people that want to use it in different ways, but that's not to say it won't work. But you're going to have to be the one to iron out the little things that aren't working. And it's a bit frustrating because that SUSE VM is actually version 11. And I've posted in the VMware forums, when's this going to be updated? And I haven't had any response back on that one. so. But more for my peace of mind, knowing that it's going to work the way I've designed it, that's why I've done it that way. Any additional questions? Earlier you were talking about the uh, watching the NICs on the host. Yep. And you had showed an example of where only one was connected and two of them were down. Is there any way to not that you necessarily want to, but is there a way to exclude a particular NIC or NICs? Yes. When you use the, um, the name parameter, this name parameter over here, hyphen, hyphen, name, you can he see here I'm only targeting VM NIC 2. I can target VM NIC 2, comma VM NIC 3, comma VM NIC 6. By default, it will get all the NICs, but you know, in some servers, there's 16 NICs, and you don't want to get all that information. So that's why the name argument is there, so you can group them the way you want and only get the information that you want and get rid of all the other information you don't want. 
Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Excellent. We've got one up the front here as well. So did I understand correct that this um, plugin will be capable of tracking all guests moving throughout yes. the... Do you, throughout the cluster? Yes. So when you're and in a... And it would display the placement of the guest uh, as you schedule the, the run of this plugin? Not at this point in time, but I, I can... Uh, probably that one would be something I would put on the guest status check that reports if it's powered on, what the VMware tools version is. I could report what host it's on, if that's what you're yeah. after. Uh, my goal, for example, is to, to know which host uh, has the guest running on. So yes. where is, at, at any time, in, at okay. any point in time, I want to know where is the guest running, at so which host. Would you prefer just, just one check that was about where the guest was, so you could sort the info mm, column? That, just that's, that's fine, or just an option somewhere. Yep. Is it and you, did you want to alert that if it's not on a particular host or you didn't want it yes. to be? Yes, alert right. if it moved to another host. I will take that and we'll add that to the plugin. Send me an email with those ideas so I don't okay. forget, but we'll definitely get that added. And that any ideas that you guys have, send them my way because it's all about making it useful. There's no point creating all this if I don't take your feedback. Um. I don't know if it's because of time constraints that you probably didn't show all the options of the plugin. Yes. But I'm just curious if, if in any way you are monitoring um, VDP, the virtual data protector, like the backups of the VM. Not is at this point. Not at this point. But okay. we can work on that. I don't mind extending it. It's just right now I'm actually uh, working from home on a little single server. So it's what I get access to. So if I can get access to other environments and look at how the VMware SDK, if I can pull that data out of the VMware SDK, then we can add it to the plugin. Once again, send me an email. And uh, I've got some business cards there as well. I can hand out, come and see me in a minute and hand them out. How does it handle network tags, uh, let's say, network interfaces that are assigned, let's say, Per, per host basis and therefore translated to the each guest on the host? Um, you mean the physical to guest relationship? Or? When you, let's say, map the network tags uh, on the physical NICs themselves, uh, when you define where each uh, VMware ho uh, guest on the host itself is going to be attached to? I don't have anything of that detail. If that's something you want added, send me an email. Nice and to, we will, yeah. I need to understand in better detail how that's being achieved, and then we can work out how to put it in there. It might be a whole new check in the plugin or added to an existing checks to display that relationship info. Thank you. Troy, the, um, is there any relationship between um, the guest name? And it, like we're monitoring a, um, uh, a host, and the host name is completely different to that guest name. So if I want to um, uh, see what's happening to a certain host, how do I get back to finding out what the guest name is? Is there a relationship to, to, to show those sort of details? I know what you're saying. I don't have any... It does sound similar to what this other question was about, is wanting to know where it is. One of the hardest things is with Nagios is that it's a state, you know, at that point in time, that's where it was. Mm. And unless it's something that can be put into performance data, it's hard to see where it is in history. You know, I don't know how to, you know, welcome to brainstorm on this, how we can take that information like what host that guest has been on through its whole life. Because that's something I, I do find very helpful to know. You know. Yeah, I've seen with other monitoring tools, I'll have a page saying uh, this is the, the host and the, currently these are all the guests that are running on it and these have moved overnight or, or whatever. But I guess my question was, um, you know, I, I'll call that ser uh, server, uh, server A. 
Yep. And so on my Nagios screen, I can see server A, and this is all performance stats. But if I want to see those VM stats, the guest name, it could be something different. So I, I guess I want to jump from seeing that particular server A details to all the guest details. I saw that you had some, some uh, on the page there, you had like guest name and, a, and an alias, DNS alias, is that a um, tie in there perhaps? Yeah, uh, that was, I know the one you're talking about, and that was about the... It was on the setup page. This has the host, the guest host name that's inside the operating system of the guest. Yes. Um, hold on. So, it's, but it says guest, and it's got that name. But that, that's not the server name, though. So, is it? the 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 name, uh, the required argument, guest, is the name of the virtual machine. Yes. The but and but it, I don't have a check that gets the name of the virtual machine, the, the name of the the guest inside the virtual machine, inside the operating system. Okay. But if the right VMware tools are installed, I do output the name, the guest host name. Yep. Is that what you're after? Yeah, and, and really I want to tie that into the, to the guest, uh, sorry, the host name, which I'm monitoring separately. Yeah. It may, oh, so if you're already monitoring that host with Windows performance counters, and NS client and things like that, yes. and you want to add these additional service checks? Yes. Yes. So that would be a simple matter of the name of the host object. So in the, um, when I run the wizard, you select, so let me just skip all the way to the end there. When I'm running the wizard here, I'm pulling down the names of the guests or these are the actual virtual machine names, and I've got no DNS name here because it's not pulling that info, but this is the host object. Yeah, that's the what page I was talking about. Right, here. so yes, you can select any of the existing guest host objects, and on the next page, when you select the disk tab, and you select this is the, that guest, that's that guest, and th that service will get added to that host object. Okay, yep. And the same with the hosts. When you run the hosts and you go into the hosts, all the checks, there will be a selection here for the names of the host objects that you want to create or use if they already exist and those services will be, get added to those objects. All right, that's great. Excellent. All right, we have time for one more question. So in relation to the uh, wizard that you've got on the screen right now, um, have you put any thought into... Uh, setting up service dependencies between uh, the ability to interact with these individual checks that you've got on the screen and the viability of the vCenter server or ESXi host? I've thought about that. The thing with the wizards is they are super easy to use. And I've tried not to overcomplicate over it. But I have been thinking of adding some information like that to the manual that would give you some suggestions about um, you know, like you're saying, um, like for instance, if the, a good example is if you had on the host two NICs and they were the NICs used for all the guest networking and both of those NICs were disconnected then all of those guests should be, uh, like there should be a service escalation set up so that they're not alerting if the, the NIC checks are down for that particular host, for those group of NICs. It's a good idea to add to the manual. All right, ladies and gentlemen, Troy will be here the rest of the week, and he has plenty of business cards that he likes to hand out, from what I've been told. Other than that, if I could have a nice big round of applause for Troy Lee one more time. Thank you so much.